I'm very excited and honored to, um, to welcome Philip Gribich uh, tonight for his lecture and reading. Uh, he's an author and journalist, a staff writer for The New Yorker, former editor at the Paris Review. Uh, his first book, uh, We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families, Stories from Rwanda, was published in 1998 and um, won the National Book Critics Circus Award. Uh, Los Angeles Book Award, the uh, New York Public Library Award, and many other awards. Um, it's an account of, um, about the, around the gen genocide. Um, then his second book, A Cold Case, um, about an unsolved double homicide in Manhattan, was published in 2008, 2001. Uh, his third book, The Ballad of Abu Ghraib, uh, about the prisoner abuse in, um, in Iraq, was published in 2008. And um, he's working on a new book, Revisiting Rwanda, um, about which he's going to, to speak right now. And I'm very honored to be presenting him, so please welcome Phil Gurridge. Thank you. It's great. Thank you for that. And thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you all. It's good to, really good to be here. And this is awful with you. I, I, I mean, I. I was thinking a bit nonfiction. I kind of hate the word nonfiction, and I think a lot of nonfiction writers do. Um, uh, you know, John McPhee, the American nonfiction writer, always says it's sort of like saying not grapefruit. Um, <laughs> what is it? It's, it's not something. And on the other hand, we're stuck with it, and it's not wrong that it's about not being something because that's what, that's what distinguishes it. I, I'm not a big fan of the genres of writing shrinking around us and I think writing programs and discussions and so forth sometimes reinforce that as um, you know, you are a playwright, you are a, uh, a fiction writer. You're, a writer is a writer. Um, I'm also a reporter and tonight I'm going to talk specifically about that side of nonfiction writing uh, for lack of a better term. That, that is, I mean, I, I, as you said, author and reporter or author and journalist, that's fine with me. Um, reporter, I think sometimes, when we say the terms creative nonfiction, I'm always a little worried about that. It sounds like a bit of a caveat, like, like you're saying, it's, it's nonfiction, but not totally. And um, I, I'm gonna take liberties or I'm gonna cheat a little on the side. And, and even, even literary, I always find that word strange, literary, all it means is written. So what we're really trying to say, it's like saying deluxe laundry detergent, you know? It's like saying, this is the quality stuff, right? It's the quality literature. It's the, it, we're, we're kind of giving ourselves a little bit of a, that's for other people to decide um, whether, whether it's quality or not. What, what we do is either write about things uh, by making them ima purely imaginative work or work that is uh, drawn from very direct observation and has certain constraints. They're formal constraints. Um, and just like the objective to me seems to be ultimately the same for most writing, which is whether it's freakish science fiction or anime uh, type uh, writing or whether it's uh, history writing or whether it's the many things that go under the category of nonfiction or whether it's novels or poems, it's to get at some kind of truthfulness and that's the, that's the test by which we, we read it. It may be unrealistic, we judge it by its truthfulness to some sense of human experience and reality um, a, a, or its ability to reflect on that. And with that in mind, I mean, uh, without totally echoing what was said at the last discussion. Um, rep representation is distortion. And to describe reality is to transform reality. No record is complete. And all of this is kind of obvious and given and inevitable and necessary, but it's still worth saying because we forget it and we lose track of it at times. And our first stories are creation stories, whatever the culture, imposing order on chaos, giving formlessness, form, separating day from night, heaven from earth, land from sea, fish from fowl, man from beast, dominion from subordination, labor from rest, creator from creation, distinguishing, defining, naming. When the authors of Genesis, whoever they were, said that we're made in our creator's image, they meant 
that they saw us as creatures created to recreate creation. And they saw that we were bound from the outset to make a mess of it. The fall, Cain and Abel, the flood. It's like an endless problem that we're told that God saw that his work was good, and we're told we are the ultimate piece of his work, and we're told that we're no good. But we are obviously in some mode supposed to be in his image, which means that he's probably a, like a failed creator too. And so we just struggle on in this business of telling stories about ourselves. And if he's part of the picture for people, I guess they tell stories about him too. Um, as I said, to describe reality is to transform it, but not if we're nonfiction writers, to transform it any which way we want. Not according simply to our wishes, but to the restrictions that reality imposes on us. We can, and we can only depict what we see by reduction, by limitation and approximation. I mean, the, the, the obvious ex, you know, sort of textbook example is that Magritte painting, Ceci n'est pas une pipe, right? It's like it's a painting of a pipe, it's not a pipe. So what is it that we do as namers and definers of our reality? We tell stories. And to tell a true story is to, to carve out some elements of the infinite complexity of things and, and give them some limited form. But to say that we can only reduce it, we can't expand reality itself by writing about it. We have to reduce it, but we can expand upon it. And that's what we do. We, we expand our perception of it by concentrating it and by concentrating what we perceive and in our representation, we kind of try to heighten it. We try to intensify reality in this act of reduction and make it sort of more recognizable and maybe a little bit more universal uh, while being super particular about it. And I think that's one of the really interesting tensions both in fiction and nonfiction, in writing in general, is that if you're trying to write uh, about the world around you and the world you see, is sort of what level of generalization, what level of particularity uh, animate each other. Um, and, and so with that in mind and with the idea that no recording can be accurate because no recording can be complete. In fact, when we talk about recording, we don't talk about reproduction. We talk about it not, we, the standard by which the quality of a recording is like talked about technically is not veracity, it's fidelity. It's how faithful is it, which is not the same as sameness, right? It's sort of like, how much does it ring true? And, you know, I'm, I'm not remotely a believer or a religious person, but I do find that, like, some of these lines in the Bible kind of define these issues very well, because I think that whatever kind of work one's doing, the problem of representation is, is actually part of your project. Um, that, that mostly what we tend to call literature, i.e. deluxe uh, laundry detergent is the stuff that has something to say about laundry detergent. It's not just laundry detergent. It's like laundry detergent that kind of like gets a, has has also in it some understanding of laundry detergent. And I'll stop that metaphor now. And 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 you know so when 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 we have this idea that like we are creators created in the image of the creator, and then you come to Exodus and God says to Moses, "No man sees my face and lives." That's where we are. We're stuck at this place where you can never get it right. So you're in a permanent pursuit of trying to tell something truthful with the understanding that it's elusive, that the truth itself is an elusive truth. And that that's your subject, both the thing you're telling about and the sort of chase. And it's the difficulty of getting at it. And what do we mean by truth? I think the word gets really quite loosely used, um, or in nonfiction, usually the standard is facts or fact checkability in literature. Again, I think fidelity is a pretty good one. Honesty is another word that I, I think is maybe underutilized or undervalued in this kind of a discussion. But I think that's, you know, in other words, the idea that you are basically attempting as honestly as you can to abide by the rules of what reality deals you. And it's really frustrating. Um, most of the time, 
if you in interview people and you talk to people and you observe things, at a certain point you think, well, I could tell this a little bit better than even this really excellent person is telling it to me by boiling it down, by cutting some corners, by uh, mashing this up. But then you're not writing nonfiction. Nonfiction is about certain kinds of formal restraints. It's the same way that a sonnet writer has to write a sonnet. If you want to write another kind of poem, fine, but don't, you know, three quatrains and two quatrains and a couplet, three quatrains and a couplet. You have to stick to the rule. If you're writing a pontoon, you write a pontoon. If you're writing nonfiction, you have to stick to the rules. And the rules are you don't make it up. You don't lie. You don't, and, li and lying and fiction are not the same because in nonfiction, writing fiction is lying. And in fiction, non lie, telling something that is made up is telling, trying to get at the truth. Uh, so what you're doing is you're cheating your reader uh, in some way, and you're cheating yourself in the challenge of that. So you have these restraints, which are frustrating and also exciting, because they are the, the contours within which you're working. And it's interesting to think that the word true it means like, it's not something we have an agreed upon understanding of. And people talk about my truth, and people talk about universal truths, which are rarely universal. They're usually people saying, my truth is everybody's truth, isn't it? Certainly. And, um, and it, it's often quite a complicated idea there. And you often have this idea that, you know, to say that somebody is like, oh, look at him, he's being true to form, he's really true to his character. Well, often that's a dig. Often you're saying that they're basically a false person. You know, when you say, wow, that's really Trump being true to form, you're not saying he's being truthful, you're saying the opposite. I was thinking about this when we were coming over here and it's this nonfiction thing. I was listening to the National Public Radio in the, in the States and they've got an ad campaign now to raise money where they say the truth has never been more important. And it drives me nuts every time. It makes me want to take the money back I've given them. It's like, so all that money I gave you for the, over the years was for when truth was less important? And were you always anticipating that there would be this time in the future when it became more important? What the hell does that mean? It's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. It's, it's journalistic self, like, you know, congratulation. We're so important now because there's a liar around. There were always liars running the country. Every single person who's ever run public office is a liar. They lie to you. If you were a journalist, you go to them, they will lie to you. They may lie to you for the good. You may actually think the lies they tell you are broadly true, but they're going to lie to you about big, big, important things that your job is to sort of try to get past. So the truth is not more important. The truth is always very important. The truth is as important as ever. Uh, might be a little bit better, but it's maybe a little less ridiculous. Tom Wolfe, who's written fiction and fictionalized nonfiction, um, and for better or worse, he has some good lines. And one is, the problem with fiction is it has to be plausible. That's not true with nonfiction. And it's true that one of the problems with nonfiction is actually getting it to conform to some of the fake shapeliness that fiction allows you, right? Fiction allows you to make thing, make people make a bit more sense than they really do and be either consistent or even inconsistent in a consistent way or inconsistent in an artful way, in a way that sort of has meaning most of the time. Because to read a novel, uh, as, as you said, Ben, uh, earlier about you know the Nouvelle Roman and to read a novel where everything is just totally incoherent and inconsistent is really hell. Um, but with with reality, it sometimes isn't quite as shapely as you would like it to be, and so you have to kind of form it. Where that's one of our challenges. It is the formal challenge, and and so what we do as reporters is we go out, and these are two totally separate activities: reporting and writing. While you're reporting, you're kind of shaping in your head as a writer, like, what is this story? How's it going to come about? Where are the pieces that I need to make it start to make some kind of shapely sense? But reporting, I mean, in the old days in the newspaper, you know, you remember those newspaper movies where the guy's on the phone, he's like, honey, get me a rewrite, you know, and, and, and he calls in and, and he's saying from the field, I got a police officer who says we got a dead body, and somebody else is typing. It's two totally separate activities, you know? And, and it's true to this day that there are people who write beautifully and report poorly, and people who report beautifully and are, okay, writers, but 
it helps to have an editor. And then there are people who like to do both, but they're still different activities. They relate to each other. One is about getting out of the house. The other one's about not leaving the house. Um, and that is a complicated dynamic that runs through working on nonfiction. Um, getting out of the house and being it. And it's about really listening to other people. It's about kind of letting the thing take you where it goes. It's about almost always not knowing where it's going to go. And I find that as a whole, I'm interested in stories that I don't understand. So stories where I think, ooh, that's really interesting. I think I have a really interesting take on it. That's a good op-ed. That's a good opinion piece. That might be even a good short essay. But it's more when I'm like, I don't understand that at all. That's really, what the hell is going on there? I don't, I don't feel like anything I'm reading about it makes sense. That starts to draw me in. Or I'm reading stories about North Korea or I'm reading stories about the Rwandan genocide and I'm starting to say like, eh, I don't really understand where any of this is coming from. There's some foundation I'm missing here. And there are questions that I have about this. So often when I look for a story, I look for like a big container. It's going to have a lot of, it's going to, I don't know what all it's going to contain, but I feel like anything that's interesting to me, I can throw in there and it's going to somehow be big enough, you know? Um, and, and Rwanda certainly uh, had had some of that dimension um, where you, and I went there the first time with the, the sense that I didn't understand what had happened. I didn't think it had been very well covered. And I wanted to understand sort of how people there understood what had happened, just literally to put together an account of the genocide and its immediate aftermath. What got me going back about 10, 15 years later was for better or worse, I was hearing that people were really managing to live together afterwards, which seemed utterly impossible at the time. And I was skeptical. Uh, it's, as I said, quite an authoritarian government. It's a complicated, very sophisticated, politically interesting government. It is a government about which, uh, what we were talking about, about monumentality on the last panel, uh, is complicated because, because, in fact, the only way to think about it, I find, that's useful is to, is to not be super simplistic about it and to say, wait, we have the ability to say, I don't really think very highly of George Bush as a president, but I really think that he is the only president who allocated the funds to defeat AIDS in Africa. And in that, he's astonishing. And he never even took much public credit for it. But everybody who knows about that knows he did that. I can appreciate that without having to revise the rest of my opinion of George Bush. I can have two thoughts. I can think Obama was horrible on press freedom, in fact. He jailed more leakers and so forth. He was restrictive in many ways. He made mistakes in the Middle East wars. He did, but I think he was like the great president of not just our generation, but probably a long time. Uh, so you can have those kinds of complex two thoughts at once but I didn't want to write about this politics so much in Rwanda this time. I wanted to try to understand what I really didn't understand, which is there was a discourse of reconciliation and specifically of forgiveness where the understanding was, look, we have hundreds of thousands of perpetrators. On the one hand, the early work that was done on understanding how a million people were put to death in Rwanda in the course of 100 days was largely on showing this wasn't ancient tribal hatreds in total chaos. It was necessarily for massive violence to happen, massive organization. That it involved the state, and it involved an intricate, sophisticated system of order. It was order. It was murderous order, not disorder. And that in itself seemed challenging, as you know from the Balkan Wars, but also in Rwanda even more because the Hutus and Tutsis with these sort of Dr. Seuss names, people thought, you know, they just go at each other. That's what they do. Nobody knew anything about them. And in the outside. And so at that point, you had that understanding. Now you have people saying, well, they're living together. And they had realized after all this work was done to show that the leaders of the state and all these higher-ups the, had instigated it, they also said, but we have hundreds of thousands of people. This crime was committed very locally. It was committed in the community. It was committed by neighbors against neighbors. 
And we have 150,000 people in prison and more accused of these crimes. How do we adjudicate that? We can't do it with conventional trials. When I was first there, the O.J. Simpson trial was on TV, and people would sit there in these Rwandan hotels and say, that's what a murder trial looks like? How do you do a million? Even the Americans with all their lawyers couldn't do a million trials at this speed, never mind the money and resources required. And then they said, well, we have our own traditional system. It's called gachacha, and, which means literally on the grass. And it's kind of the idea that it was a kind of small claims court, really. You stole my cow, or I think you stole my cow. We get together somebody who I think is a person of integrity, somebody you think is a person of integrity. We agree, we sit down, we have a discussion, and some kind of compensation and, and, and agreement is worked out about this matter, and we settle it amongst ourselves in a kind of everybody in the community who's involved attends and, and, and testifies and speaks about it. But it had never been used, even in the old system, for murder, much less mass political murder and mass communal violence. So they said, well, but we have this, and we should have Rwandan solutions. These human rights people, they have these ideas about lawyers. We don't need all that. That'll just confuse things. And what they had a very deep understanding was is none of these killers are admitting that it was a crime. They're still loyal to the crime. They're still loyal to their secrets. And as long as they're loyal to their secrets, they're not able to reintegrate into the society. And they are also killing witnesses, survivors, if they get a chance. And survivors are seeking to commit revenge crimes. They're trying to take out the people who killed them. And we've got to stop that. There must be no, there has to be absolute security first. But then they developed by 2000, so about five years after the genocide, this, this gachacha law. And the idea was, we're going to set up 12,000 communal courts. Rwanda's tiny. It's six million people. It's the size of, in America, West Virginia, Vermont. It's a very small territory. Uh, on the map, its name is written next to it, usually, because it can't fit inside it in most maps, you know? And, and so it's a tiny little place. And now it's about 10 million, 12 million people, but still, it's small. And they said, well, this crime was committed locally. The understanding of the crime is local. It should be judged by the local people. They will elect their own courts, people of integrity. They use the same word from tradition. And they will, uh, will have the courts right in the place where it happened. The prisoners will be brought back from the prisons, and they'll be incentivized to confess. Those who refuse to confess will still be judged by whatever evidence is presented. But the whole community is supposed to come and everybody speaks up whenever they want. This went on for about eight years, and it had a false start, and it was screwed up, and people were unhappy, and there were killings around it, and then suddenly it started up again, and it worked a bit better. 40,000 of the original judges were suddenly accused of genocide. They had to be removed and like, replaced with judges who weren't accused of genocide. Um, I mean, there were things like this that were wild, but if you think about, I don't know what your court system in Bulgaria is like, but certainly in the United States, to be just an ordinary peasant, uh, the equivalent of an ordinary peasant elsewhere, and get a fair trial is not such an obvious thing, even with all the lawyers and all the nice due process and habeas corpus that we have. In Rwanda, it ended up working reasonably well, because at a certain point, the density of confession started to incentivize other people to confess. And then, as those people started to get reintegrated, they were released, and they were living together again. That's really where my new book starts, with me basically unable to comprehend this. And I'll, I'll read a little bit from, from the opening of that book now. Um, the book's called you, you Hide That You Hate Me and I Hide That I Know, which is a Rwandan expression. And when I first heard it in the 90s, I thought it was a very cynical, kind of dark, twisted view of society. And then... When I started to go back, I started to think that actually it's basically the description of civic life, you know, almost the gentlemanly code. Because what's the alternative to you hide that you hate me? It's that you don't hide it and that it's all out there. And so I also think that reflects on this whole problem we have, which you'll see is active in this book from the very beginning, which is, and it came up with Diana, you were talking about it too, like, you know, we don't know how to talk about the past. Well, maybe we don't always want to. 
You know, maybe it, like people want to get on with their lives. People don't always want to have to be confronting again the pains of the past. So there are times to confront it, there are times to move on. There are times to confront it, there are times to move on. What's the right balance? Nobody knows, right? That's, and and it's, it's, the main thing is that that should be at least an active question. So I start the book with a little quote from the Iliad by Homer. Think of your own father. I deserve more pity. I have suffered what no man on earth has yet endured. I pressed to my lips the hands of the man who killed my son. I got an email from a friend. Hi. I was yesterday at the lake where my brother-in-law, Victor's family, owns a lot of land. Amazing, beautiful place. And it seems the government wants to make a sort of Saint-Tropez over there. Before 1994, two Tutsi families lived in the village. Victor's grandparents, with their five grown-up children, with their partners and kids, they're all killed. So yesterday, we met the only survivor of the other Tutsi family. He's a childhood friend of Victor's. The guy's looking after their land. He was saved by a Hutu woman who hid him in a house and brought him food. She's now his wife. They both testified in many of the Gachacha trials and the Gachacha courts here, in the genocide trials and the Gachacha courts here, as they knew exactly who killed in this village. A lot of the killers were family members of his wife and friends of the survivor. Now the killers are back in the village after prison time, and I cannot understand. Also, the killers hugged Victor as they knew each other and played with each other when Victor, as a kid, went on holiday to his grandparents. It is like 1994 did not happen. We met the survivor in a bar eating brochettes and making jokes with the guys who killed the big Tootsie families. So they live again in the village, the killers and the only survivor. And if you don't know the whole story behind the village, it seems a totally normal situation, but I felt so uncomfortable and sad. The only good thing I saw is the survivor and his wife but they're forced to live with the killers and everybody's acting as if nothing happened. Victor and I both left in confusion. Anyway, have to go now, just wanted to tell you this. And now I was back in Rwanda. All day beneath the fitful thunder of colliding clouds, the hazy air quivered with the threat of rain. An hour before dark, in tarnished sea green light, it came, hissing across the valley. A man stopped in the street and took off his shoes. Some women ran for cover the way they do, barely bending their knees, torsos dipping from side to side. The smell of renewed earth blew in the windows. The loamy, wet brick smell of splashed red dirt and battered grasses. And everything got wild and loud. The sky swarmed black and silver, trees and bushes thrashed in the streaming. It was tumult without end, then it was quiet. The storm passed, the horizon returned, hills ripped from yellow dusk, and in the valley, the lowlands steamed. After dark, my friend came to see me, the one who wrote the email. She brought Victor along, a young man with tired eyes and an injured, injured inward air. They had gone back again the day before to his ancestral village, and once again they joined his boyhood friend, the last remaining Tootsie there, for a beer at the local bar. Six months had passed, and my friend said, it was just as I wrote you, everybody together like no big deal. Nothing was different, but I saw it differently. What had unsettled her on her first visit was her, how convincingly untroubled the scene felt. Like 1994 did not happen, she said. This time, the same behavior appeared to her in a sinister light, every word and gesture laced with tension. The survivor's camaraderie with his neighbors now struck her as forced and entirely one-sided. He was buying everyone else beer and nobody returned the favor. He was laughing too much, and his laugh was too loud, and nobody laughed with him. He was overdoing it, trying too hard to belong or to make it seem as if he belonged. And my friend surmised that he was acting that way because she and Victor were there, city people, wearing city clothes, speaking French, visiting in a private car, strangers with some money and with who knew what interests and connections. Their presence, she figured, made the other villagers suspicious. Victor especially disconcerted them the heir to the murdered Tootsies of the place. They don't trust him, she said. So they can't trust that survivor either. They think, what's this guy up to? And he can see that, so he tries to appease them. She mimicked his attitude, 
shoulders hunched, head drawn in on the neck, smiling, hands clasped, submissive, obsequious, almost cowering. He was buying his neighbor's drinks to buy them off, she said. Like, I'm really with you, I'm really one of you, I'm a villager too, it's okay. And seeing him that way, convinced my friend that the frictionless fellowship she'd found so perplexing on her first visit must also have been a charade. She made a convincing case, but her email was convincing too. What made her so sure now? Wasn't it too easy to revolve so much complexity so tidily and maybe even a bit cynical to assume that what looked okay couldn't be? There was so much about how people lived together after the genocide that they themselves couldn't understand. But feeling confused was different from saying, no, I don't believe it. Just because you can't imagine something's real, I said, doesn't mean that it's fake. It is fake, Victor said. This was the first thing he'd said in at least half an hour, and before he could elaborate, he cut himself off. I'm sorry. I'm not feeling well. I should go. He said he'd been in distress, too many bad feelings, since they left the village the previous afternoon. He'd been unable to sleep, unable to eat. I'm sorry, he said again. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to be by myself now. He told us goodbye, and we told him to take care, but apparently Victor wasn't as eager as he said to be alone in the night again. He backed his chair away from the table, then made no move to leave. My friend and I went on talking. She said, maybe I'm being simple, but when you said cynical, that's not right. I was really feeling for that survivor guy. I thought, he lives with this. We were just stopping by, but he lives with this every day in that little place, and nothing real gets said. We all live with it like that, Victor said. He still sat apart from us, and his voice sounded estranged, too, as if he were talking to himself. But he wanted to be heard. That's how we live, in between everything that's unsaid. We don't discuss with each other. We don't confront our issues, our past. We had gachacha, and okay, what came out there came out. But that was that. Even with our own group, even in our families, we keep it inside. Rwandans keep so much inside, we don't even know what we're keeping there. The whole country's just like that bar. But what exactly were they supposed to say to each other in that bar? They all knew each other's stories. How would revisiting it together put them more at ease? I understood Victor's complaint, but not what he was asking for. I reminded him that just stopping by his village for a beer had left him wrecked. Did he really imagine he'd sleep better at night if all that was kept inside came out? And no, he said, you're right. But even so, I'm not wrong. Oh, no. Here we go. <laughs> да чуете все пак и в български превод началото на а, новата книга на Филип Гурович, която е се заглавие Ти криеш, че ме мразиш, аз крия, че го знам. И започва с един цитат от Илиада. Свой баща припомни си. За жал съм аз по-достоен. Върша каквото от смъртните никой до днес не е сторил. Сам аз целувам ръцете, които си нами убих. Превда на Александър Милев и Благ Димитрова. Получих имейл от една приятелка. Здравей! Вчера бях на езерото, където семейството на Зетми и Виктор притежават доста земя. Мястото е невероятно красиво и правителството май се готви да го превърне в своя города Сентропе. До 1994 в селото живееха две семейства туци. Бабата и дядото на Виктор заедно с пете им порасли деца и техните съпрузи и деца бяха избити. Та вчера се запознах с единствения оцелял от другото семейство туци. Той е приятел на Виктор от детските години, грижи се за земите му, бил е спасен от жена Хуто, която го скрила в една къща и му носил храна. Сега тя е негова съпруга. Двамата са били свидетели по много от процесите за геноцида в тукашните съдилища Гачача, тъй като знаят кой точно убива в селото. Много от убийците са били роднини на жена му и приятели на самия оцелял. Сега те са си излежали при съдите и са се върнали в селото. Същите тези убийци прегръщаха Виктор, понеже се познават и са си играли като деца, когато той прекарвал вакансиите при баба си и дядо си. Като че ли 94-та никога не е била. Заварихме оцелелия в един бар да хапва шишчета и да се шегува с хората, избили големите семейства туци. 
Ето, че отново те и той, единственият оцелял, живеят заедно в селото. И ако човек не знае цялата история на това село, всичко изглежда съвсем нормално. Но на мен ми стана ужасно тъжно и неловко. Единственото хубаво нещо, което видях, бяха оцелели и жена му. Само, че те са принудени да живеят с убиците и всички се държат така, сякаш нищо не е било. Двамата с Виктор си тръгнахме смутени. Както и да е, трябва да приключвам, просто исках да ти разкажа това. Ето, че отново бях в Руанда. През целия ден под конвулсивния трясък на блъскащите се облаци, маранята трептеше пред надвисналата заплаха на дъжда. Час преди мръкване сред мътна морско-зелена светлина, той заплющя над долината. Един мъж се спря на улицата и си забу обувките. Няколко жени побягнаха, за да се скрият по характерния си начин, почти без да свиват колене, поклащайки се наляво надясно. През прозорците на хумирисът на разбудената земя. Глинестия напомняш мокър кирпич, дъх на разкашка на червеникава пръст и помляна трева. Всичко побесня и затрещя. Небето бълваше сребриста чернота. Дървета и храсти се гънеха в пороя. Грохотът нямаше край. После отихна. Бурята премина, хоризонтът се завърна. Хълмове прорязани от жълтия здрач. И от дъното на долината се надигна пара. Вече беше мръкнал, когато приятелката ми дойде да ме види същата, която ми бе пратила имейла. Доведе и Виктор, млад мъж с уморени очи и болезненото излъчване на затворен в себе си човек. Предния ден отново бяха ходили в селото на дедите му и отново се бяха видяли с приятеля му от детинство, последния туци, на побира в местния бар. Бяха изминали 6 месеца и приятелката ми каза. Беше точно както ти писах, всички си седяха заедно, като че ли най-нормалното нещо. И нищо не се беше променил, само дето аз го видях другояче. Онова, което е без мотил при първото и посещение, беше съвсем правдоподобното спокойствие на цялата сцена. Сякаш 94-та никога не е била. Този път обаче същото поведение и се сторило злокобно. От всяка дума изжествуваха у напрежение. Приятелските отношения между оцелели и неговите съседи се видяли принудени, едностранчиви. Той черпел всички сбира, а никой не му връщал по черпката. Смеял се много и твърде високо, а никой не се смеял с него. Преигравал, със все сили се старал да покаже, че един от тях или поне така да изглежда. Приятелката ми е предположила, че било защото тя и Виктор били там. Хора от града, облечени в градски дрехи, говорещи френски, дошли със собствена кола. Непознати с известни финансови възможности и дявол знае какви интереси и връзки. Присъствието им решила бъде подозрение от другите селени. Особено ги притеснявал Виктор, наследник на техните избити със селени туци. Те не му вярват, рече тя. Не могат да вярват и на оцелелия, казват си, този пък какво крой. Той го усеща и се старае да ги успокои. И тя го изимитира. Приведените рамене, главата при свития врат, усмихнат, ръцете сключени, покорен, сервилен, почти оплашен. Черпел със селените си, за да ги умилостиви. Все едно се опитваше да каже, и аз съм един от вас, и аз съм от селото, всичко е наред. Като го видяла такъв, приятелката ми се уверила, че безоблачното другарство, което и се сторило толкова объркващо първия път, също било фарс. Звучеше убедително, но убедителен беше и имейла ти. Откъде тази сигурност сега? Не беше ли твърде прибързано да сведе нещо, толкова сложно до такава удобна простота? А може би даже цинично да предположи, че това, което изглежда нормално, не би могло да бъде. Толкова много противоречи имаше около това, че хората живееха заедно след геноцида, че те самите не можеха да ги проумеят. Но смущението беше нещо по-различно, отколкото просто да кажеш «Не, не го вярвам». Само защото не можеш да си представиш, че нещо се случва в действителност, казах и, не значи, че то е престорено. Престорено е, намеси се Виктор. Обади се за първ път след близо половин час и още преди да продължи, сам се прекъсна. Съжалявам, не ми е добре, ще си вървя. Каза, че откак напуснали селта предния след обед, бил неспокоен. Прекалено много лоши чувства. Не може да спи, не може да яде. Съжалявам, повтори. Не желая да говоря за това, в момента искам да остана сам. Сбогува се с нас, казахме му да се пази, но той очевидно не бързаше чак толкова да остане сам в нощта. Припозна стола си в страни от масата, но не понечи да си тръгне. Приятелката ми и аз продължихме да говорим. 
Може, може би упростявам нещата, рече тя, но не беше прав, като каза, че съм цинична. Наистина ми е мъчно за оцеление. Помислих си, той живее с това. Ние само се бяхме отбили, а той живее така всеки Божи ден в това се оце и никой нищо не изрича на глас. Всички живеем така, каза Виктор. Продължаваше да, да седи отделно от нас. Гласът му също звучеше отчуждено, сякаш говореше сам на себе си. Така живеем, посред всичко, което остава неизречено. Не говорим помежду си, не се изправяме пред проблемите си, пред миналото. Имахме гачача и добре, каквото излезе наяве, там излезе. Толкова. Дори в нашата собствена група, в семействата ни, всичко остава вътре в нас. Рондийците носим толкова много отвътре, че дори не знаем какво е. Цялата страна прилича на този бар. А какво всъщност се предполагаше да си кажат хората в бара? Те всички си знаеха историите и ако си ги преразкажеха заедно, това щеше ли да ги успокои? Разбирах жалбата на Виктор, но не и това, което искаше. Припомних му, че дори само отбиването му в селото да изпи една бира го е опустошило. Действително ли си въобразяваше, че ще спи по-добре, ако това, което носеше у себе си, излезеше навън? Не, отвърна той. Имаш право. Но и така да е. Аз също съм прав. Thank you for the translation. Um, you're, uh, at one point I was uh, editing the Paris Review and I had got a hold of an early manuscript or a uh, galley of Peter, uh, one of Peter Carey's novels, the novelist Peter Carey, and I wanted to do an excerpt. And... Um, And I looked at it and I suddenly thought, oh, I see a way to get through the beginning of it, just taking a few things out that are mostly there for the purposes of setting things up along the way. Right? They're, they really, you can take them out, nothing's really missing from the scene except the setup. So I worked on it for a little while and I thought, this is pretty good, this is a pretty good cut, you know? Um, and I sent it to him and I didn't really hear anything for a few days. And, uh, and then I called him and he's like, man, I... I It's a, it, it's a really good cut. It's a really, really good cut. You're right. Uh, but, but I'm going to be an asshole about this because he said, um, because I'm not going to let you do it. And he said, because order is meaning. And I put it all there this way. And, the, you know, he's at a position in, the, in his writing that he doesn't need to have an excerpt somewhere that it's not going to pay him very well. It's not going to get him new readers. He just thought, I don't want an alternative version of this order this meaning out there i don't want to have to think about it this way i put it together this way and that's how it is and he you can hear him kind of wincing like you know taking and calling himself names and stuff and i was like you know you're right order's meaning yeah yeah no that's <laughs> i realized i guess i should go back to being a writer instead of an editor because i'm supposed to like try and talk him into this but i was like you're right no yeah okay thanks you know sorry to waste your time um and uh And I really, that's stuck in my head a lot over the years, like this order is meaning thing. And I don't always mean it that one shouldn't, but so for instance, I say that because this is not how it is in the book. The book begins with the email, but then in fact, for the interests of time, I brought back uh, her here. But in fact, after that rainstorm, the person who comes to see me in the evening is a, another, a completely different person, a guy who has, I don't know who he is, he's just been set up with a, by a mutual friend who says, you know, you should talk to Antoine, Antoine needs to talk, and he's a survivor, and there's a whole sort of internal monologue about survivors that kind of gets wound into it. And the guy comes and picks me up, and there's a bit about how Rwanda's developing, and, you know, he's, what his business is, he's in the used car trade, and how he goes to used car lots in L.A. and gets cars, and all this stuff is wound together that sort of introduced. And then... We stop for cigarettes for him. Uh, he wants to get cigarettes and we stop and he goes to this gas station and this like, guy shows up at the window and like, out of nowhere in the dark and starts to talk to me. And, and he's got this very like, you know, he's choking on a little piece of cake because it's the first thing he ate in a few weeks and this and that. And then he starts telling me and I'm like, oh, so he wants money. And, and basically starts telling me the survivor story. You know, I was one of those who was under a body pile and 
and uh, and and now you should, you know, and then he asked for money because like we're all the same under the skin or something. And um, and Antoine comes back and he sees him at that moment. I give him a few coins and he and Antoine comes back and he runs over to Antoine. He's begging and you know saying this. He knows who Antoine is. And when we get in the car, I was like, yeah, that's a sad story. And he's like, that guy, he's a junkie. Um, and I said, yeah, but he's a survivor too. And he said, no, he wasn't even here. He was like out of the country. He was in Burundi or something at the time. And I think it's kind of twisted to start the book maybe with this like fake survivor, but it's also funny. And it's also just like meant to remind you that don't, you know, you're, you're, you get played in various ways here. And then, and then Antoine, we go out and he's, been set up to me as like this kind of polished, boring guy who actually has stuff to say and he's incredibly boring for a long time. And then he gets, suddenly plunges into this Gachacha story. And the story is that he'd been asked to go to Gachacha for his parents' killers. They, they called him up, they said, oh, we got the guy who's killed your father. He's like, I don't want anything to do with it, man. You're the court, I, I, what am I supposed to do? I want, and there's a little bit more detail, but he goes finally. They like say, you gotta come. Like, you can't not come. You're, this is a summons. It's not an invitation. So he goes, and he said, ah, it, was, it was weird, you know, like, I get there, and he's got his whole family there, and I'm like, yeah, and you're there all by yourself. He's like, yeah, of course, that's not the issue. It's like, the guy's daughter was my ex-girlfriend. And, and uh, I'm like, really? Uh, you know, from before? And he's like, meaning, you know, before he killed your father? And it's like, no, no, after. And so it's this whole exchange about that. And he's like, yeah, but she didn't do anything wrong. Like, I really liked her. Like, we had a, I, I liked her. And, uh, and then she's there with her father. And, and, you know, it's not her fault that he killed my father. She, and I'm very sure that she was innocent. For whatever reason, he felt very confident of like that. But then I was like, but do you think she knew? And that's where it gets like really kind of dark and spirally at the end of the night, you know, like he's drinking a lot and we're sitting there and he's basically kind of saying, well, that's not my problem. That's her problem, kind of, you know, like why, like he's dodging it, frankly. Um, and, and he resents Kachacha to some extent for having presented him with this. He's like, you don't understand, there's somebody I could have married. You know, I can't marry her now. I'm like, that's, you know, I can see that, you know, that would be comp, that would be heavy. And, but he's like, but that's fucked up. Like, I should be able to marry her. Um, you know, like, this was something that happened between, our, and it gets at something that's much more explicit with the younger people now, like the people who were 10 at the time. He was 20, 25. The people who were 10 at the time of the genocide and are now in their 30s, a lot of them don't even know these relationships and are perfectly happy to have affairs with each other. And there are even people who, Ma there are marriages between people whose families killed each other at that level of closeness. And he's vague, like there are things that you just can't, you don't get the perfect answer from. But that's where, then I return, then, you, then this woman comes back with Victor, right? So you're getting at this thing and the, and the, and the motto, you'll see the nonfiction sort of theme here, the motto of Gachacha courts which I didn't really register because I was mostly going afterwards. I was there after 10 years, they had a closing ceremony for the Gachacha courts that adjudicated over 1,800,000 cases, which mostly were property cases. Of the capital murder cases, they had 450,000 uh, people who were tried and about 220,000 who were convicted, which actually was a pretty high acquittal rate, uh, considering, which is one way you judge whether courts are total, you know, uh, automatic pre, a foregone conclusion or whether they have some liberty to hear the case and judge the case. And they did. And, um, and then the motto of the courts was truth heals. So that, <laughs> that's like, you can see exactly where that's coming from. That's where coming from psychology and human rights rhetoric of the last half century. It is, it is the given, it is the kind of conventional wisdom that like what is not exposed to light will come back and bite you, that everything that is unexamined is, is sort of and unexorcised is going to be worse. But the fact is that that assumes a lot of things. It presupposes that the truth can be got at in any number of ways. But even if we accept that, is it true <laughs> the truth heals? Like is that a truth? And it seems to me really unclear. 
And it's this kind of radical proposition. And we all know what it means. Like everybody in Rwanda understood it, part of like a political slogan in a largely illiterate society where you're trying to deal with like incredible complexity is that you have to create, again, like I said, for the stories I look for, you have to create giant containers, right? You have to create, and one of the giant containers was, we're all Rwandans, so Hutu and Tutsi should become less important which is true, they are all Rwandans. They do have a shared identity. So this kind of positive nationalism that allows us to be a little bit de-ethnicized, which is very different than the Balkans. Where there, was no, there was no physical dis, uh, um, uh, geographic territorial separation that was historical. There was no language difference. There was no religious difference. There was no None of these massive, massive defining differences of the Yugoslav wars were in play in Rwanda. They really were all intermingled and spoke the same language and had probably got along better in the pre-colonial period so they could blame some of it on the colonial uh, history. Um, so, you know, the idea was this isn't who we have to be. And we can be proud of being Rwandans without having to only be identified by these other things. But obviously, the, the, the you know, for a guy like Antoine, who sees his girl, ex-girlfriend there, and is like, I liked her. You know, she made me feel good. Maybe he didn't want to know that relationship, because, like, what good was it to him? But somebody else might say, imagine I'd continued that relationship, which is kind of what I was getting at when I was like, do you think she knew? Imagine you'd continued that relationship only later to find out. And then intermarriage runs... If you, anybody's read my first book, it actually, the very first scene in that book is about a pygmy who wants to marry a white woman, and it's kind of about this idea of like, well, why should that matter if, if race doesn't matter? Um, and, uh, and, and so this, this like, you know, we're writing about this big tragedy, and it does seem that it's kind of important that everybody keeps leaning towards the big issue of comedy, which is it ends with a marriage, right? And, it, and it's sort of like miscegenation or marriage or whatever you want to call it, mixing, is kind of the best definition of things being a bit different or working again. And especially when we have all this understanding of how ethno, ethno, ethnic identity has been artificially constructed. But the reality is that blood has made it true. Bloodshed has made it true. It's prudent if your artificial and completely, like maybe otherwise substanceless identity as a Tutsi, and that person's substanceless identity as a Hutu means life and death, it's prudent for you to want to know who the hell they are and who their family was and what they're loyal to and what their secrets are. And so breaking those secrets in this complicated process here and trying to figure out is there some place to get to is very interesting. And so does the truth actually heal that? And does this re-traumatization, because one of the things that's made this book extremely difficult, it's taken me many, many more years than I expected, is that I thought, okay, it's basically easier to write about people trying to get along than about people slaughtering each other. It's less gory, it's less horrible, it's less like just sheer gruesome material. In fact, it's much more gruesome material because Gachacha involved this confrontation where the killers would get up and they'd say, yeah, I killed your old mother like this and I killed your little girl like smashing her here and then I threw the bodies over there. And then... The same person would then go to the next person and the next person and the next person. And like sometimes these people would have 30, 40 murders that they were involved in, all of people that they knew, all of people who knew each person in there. And hearing that, on the one hand, feeling that the person was no longer, as I said earlier, loyal to their secrets, was no longer loyal to the crime, no longer belonged to that, but it somehow re-entered you know, the human fold meant something to people. But hearing it made it very hard when the person at the end went through the pro forma, and I apologize for these things, and ask your forgiveness, and you as are basically part of the deal, is you're required by the same state to say, we forgive you. And then you're like, well, how real was that? Was it real? It seems totally fake. When I was there in 2009 and started this project, a long time ago now, um, there was one uh, killer who I followed a lot over the years and the people from the families that he uh, diminished. And his brother-in-law, he, he, he was married to a Tootsie woman, this killer. He killed enormously on his hill. He killed scores of people and led the other killers. And one of the people he tried to kill was his brother-in-law. 
and who came after hiding in the bush for about a month to the house one night because he was desperate and had nowhere else to go and thought, maybe my sister can at least protect me. And the second he showed up, this killer, Gasumari, was on him and handed him over to other people to kill. And he survived. He, he fell as they were leading him off in the night. It's, you know, there's no electricity. It's dark. He fell into a ditch and suddenly realized that these guys were a little bit drunk and were like, where'd he go? You know, really one of those classic kind of movie things. You know? and, and so he crawled away and he was saved and they were doing other th They just let him, they didn't hunt too hard. And he survived. His brother-in-law didn't know that until he came back from two years in Congo in the refugee camps, found him there. And that's when I first met him, like the week that the brother-in-law came back in 96. Now, and, and he was scared silly that this brother-in-law was back. He was terrified, but he was unwilling to say anything to the authorities because they would blame him. Now, 12 years later, the brother-in-law had gone through Gachacha, had been the greatest confessor in the neighborhood. So he's the biggest killer, he was the biggest confessor. He'd confessed everything, he had told everything. Everybody agreed that he was totally truthful and honest. He was aggressively truthful and honest. And even on things where there was a dispute, everybody, the, the other people who hated him would say, you gotta believe him, he's true. This brother-in-law I found with another sister, so they both are the brother and sister of the sister who's married to this killer. And they're saying, you know, we saw a lot of her again when he was in prison. That was nice. We got to have our sister back. And she was not happy with the way he behaved in the genocide, but she has small children with him she's raising and so forth, and so she was going to have to take care of them, and he did protect her during the genocide. But now that he's out of jail, we, we can't really see, we can't bring ourselves to go over there. He came to us, he said, forgive me. And we said, yeah, fine. You know, they, the, way, the way they said it was like, ça va, you know. <laughs> Pardonnez-moi, ça va, was the translation. Who know what they said in Kenya Rwanda? But that, that was good enough for me. I thought that was like nice and stark. And, uh, and so they say, but how do I, why should I even look in my heart if I don't know if it's coming from his heart? You know, why should I even start all of that? Why should I make myself vulnerable to this son of a bitch again, basically, is what they're saying. And... It's just a program of the state reconciliation. They, don't, they say that not to say it's nothing, but to say it's not from us. It, like we, we're obliged. We have to live together. We have no choice. And I wrote about that, and I left it there, and it was a sort of stark stalemate. And you wondered, how is this really going to work? It seems kind of fake. A few years later, I go back, and I'm digging into it more, and I start finding the judges from his Gachacha case, and I'm talking to one of them who used to be their neighbor, and he's like, yeah, but the brother-in-law, he, he goes out drinking with the killer in the bar all the time now. And I said, he does? You know, I said, no, he told me he wouldn't have anything to do with him again. She said, yeah, but after that, the brother-in-law went to him on his, I mean, the killer went to him on his knees, and the brother-in-law sort of forgave him. So I went to the brother-in-law, and he said, yeah, yeah, you know, um, it's true. And I said, but you said that you guys would never have anything to do with him again. You know, what changed? He said, it's true. When you came, I was sitting here with my sister. He remembered it exactly. Um, they don't get a lot of, like, visitors from strange guys from New York who ask a lot of questions. And so they were like, you know, uh, yeah, we were sitting here. We were actually discussing, what are we going to do about this? Are we going to keep him at bay forever? Or should we kind of say, he's broken. He's not that guy anymore. And he'd always been abusive of her. And now he's not. He's treating her better. He's humbled somewhere. He has shifted. He's not that guy for whatever reasons. And what if we put it behind us? He's not in that context either. He's not scary unless the system changed. And we have some confidence that it's not changing that way for the moment. And then, yeah, he came and he had this whole ceremony. He came to us and he begged for forgiveness. And I said, he came on his knees. He said, yeah, but I told him, like, that's ridiculous. Get off your knees. Be a man. You know, and I, I, you, you sort of like the guy better and you take the whole thing more seriously when you hear him say that. Like, yeah, he came to my door on his knees. What a jerk. You know, and, and, and then he said, but, you know, then he stood up and he said, I'm sorry. And, and I said, but do you really go to have, like, they, I saw them in the town, like, going out for a beer without staging it for me. Um... So that's real too. Those two things are real. Those two things are true. You asked earlier about like the true, you know, those are both true. Those are, and, and without following, I think one of the things that most of our, what we do in nonfiction reporting is we get a slice. 
necessarily. We go in for a month, we go in even for a year, you know, my year in, two years, whatever it is. Going back to this thing over time, I realized like kind of what, how much the fiction of journalism, I mean, we all know about it with daily journalism, we all sort of feel it when we're, and you have to act authoritative when you write a piece because you can't say, well, like I was only there for a month and I've never been there before. And I'm like, <laughs> that, that act, even if it's true, it's really hard to not just be annoying when you do that. Like then at a certain point, the reader's like, get over your uncertainty. Tell me what's going on. I, wouldn't, I wasn't wrong in that first story. It was an accurate description of the moment. But like going back to these things over time is incredibly interesting and complex, and it complicates it. And it also complicates all the categories. Because here's the brother-in-law, and now the brother-in-law's getting along with them, but the other neighbor's like, well, that's because he's his brother-in-law. You know, it's like family pressures again. It has nothing, I would never do that. I was invited to that ceremony. I didn't go. Why would I go to that? You know, he was always a jerk. Um, and, and always manipulative and always imposing himself. He used to like to kill people. Now he likes to make them forgive him, you know, and, uh, which was true. I felt that too. He would implicate me. He tried to get me at one point to pay his gachacha fines. Look how much I've, so much better ever since I confessed to you in 1996. That made me start to confess to gachacha. Now I'm a better man. I was like, forget it. Um, you know, but so you watch these characters that get molded through this different kind of history over time. And it is at times comical, where it really shouldn't be. Um, but you also realize that this question of the truth and the truth healing or not healing, time heals, and the fact that people want to get on with things is probably also a huge disincentive. It's not that everybody's always repressed. It's not that everybody's always inhibited. It's not that there's this truth that's explosively always bursting to get out. That's all there. But maybe I'll just end with, there was a the daughter of one of this killer's many victims was a woman named Chantal. And she, when I first met the old lady I mentioned in the last session, um, who had the house that that young girl uh, had been living in, uh, she was in the ruins in this village and it was a year after the genocide and she was very, she was very beaten up. And, and she had this niece with her, another niece, called um, Chantal. And Chantal, uh, I found again, about 15 years later, and she had also uh, been a gachacha judge. Many of these survivors became gachacha judges, and that's another story, but the extent to which their own process of investigating this thing, was, for them, it was healing. Being in that position, and day after day, hearing these horrible things, they got no compensation for it, they got training, they had to go through it, it was very traumatizing for them on one level, but I mean, I actually met people who said, I literally did not speak out loud for two years after the genocide, like they had kind of traumatic muteness. And Gachacha, I started to get my voice back because hearing them one after the other have to tell the truth. And, and, be, and all I wanted to do was kill them when they walked in there. But I had a job and it was a court and there were rules and we abided by them and it ultimately made sense. None of it made sense case by case in a sense. You know, none of it made personal sense one by one. But in this larger aggregate, the people who actually were part of the courts had a very deep understanding, which I found, again, a different perspective than just going to the survivors. And so I'm with Chantal, and I was asking her by the, about this killer one by one, like, because I'd got a record of much of his court case. I was saying, well, what about this person? What? And all of a sudden she said, there were a lot of people, and most of them were her relatives, by the way, and I don't remember, because I've tried to erase it from my memory. It's of no use to me anymore. What use is it today to be stuck with history? The genocide happened. It came and it went. It's done. That's it. There's no choice. There aren't many choices. The only choice we have is to live together again in a good atmosphere with the others. It's better to calm yourself and give yourself peace. That's the only way of getting over the thing. And I thought it was kind of deep. I mean, it's, you know, it's not that or the other, right? You can look at that and think she's just shoving it aside. She's saying this after all of that. She's saying, I don't want to go back there again. We went there. We did a lot. We, I know those answers. She's not saying, I don't really know. She's saying, I don't want to go through this list with you. I don't, what, what use is it to go back over this? 
You know, I know where they, what happened, I know who was buried where, I know that. But the constant revisiting of this isn't good. Meanwhile, there are programs for younger people and so forth, but this, this process of kind of writing a nonfiction about people who are essentially enacting in many ways the stuff that we do, investigating, excavating, grappling with the purposes of it, is actually very interesting over time uh, to, to sort of see how the forms of what we're doing and the forms of what they do with it are driven by very different understandings and to try to get a bit closer to theirs and not to go in with this sort of assumption that like here's what people need to do afterwards you know they need to constantly go through this they need to confront it this way they have to have this kind of justice if it's not justice it's a wrong not everything that isn't justice is an injustice you know not everything that's an injustice can be solved by justice one of the other opening quotes for the whole book is this line from william gaddis maybe i'll end with that which is just justice you get justice in the next life. In this life, we have the law. So, and we have time for a few questions, maybe, I think. Or not. <laughs> yeah, Diana. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all of the time when you were talking, I was thinking about the film, The Act of Killing of Joshua Oppenheimer. And I just wanted to ask you how you felt after all this. What changed with you after all this? Me? Yes. I've yes. Ne never been able to answer that question. I, I've ne I get asked that question. Many times. Yeah, but like, who was I before? I mean, that would be a very complicated <laughs> question to answer. No, but maybe I had a pretty dark view of people, and it was confirmed. But um, maybe I'm maybe I'm actually more forgiving now. Actually, no, seriously. I mean, after this book, more than the other. But after reporting it, I'm more confused about these things. I don't really. I mean, shouldn't some things be unforgivable, right? I mean, honestly. I mean, we we in a way we want to believe that. And by the way, I've talked to people who know it even much better than I do. It's not a theme in Holocaust literature, forgiveness. It has to do with this very specific, intense communal intimacy in Rwanda. It's a very specific, and it's something about their culture, which is also traditional culture and Christian culture. It's, a very, it's the most Catholic country in Africa. So it's this combination of things. So there's also a leap of faith, right? In order to like really forgive the person who killed your children, and like have that person meet your new children. What the hell's going on? Why should anybody have to do that? Right? Why should you have to do that? And most people who, you don't hear like this sort of, most Holocaust survivors certainly, and I don't know how this is in the Balkans, I'm sure it's somewhere in between, but they don't really have this personal sense of that guy did it, right? Even though some of them were betrayed by people in their own community, but you don't have them you know, the people, they're not saying, I want to get that particular guard. We must find him. It's not like that. It's, it's this deep personal. It's Hitler, right? And, and, and the Nazis. And this is much more personal. So the Oppenheimer movie, I really admired the project. I think his second movie, The Sound of Silence, is a great, great movie. It's a much greater movie. And it doesn't sensationalize. I did not. <laughs> My wife and I had the same thing. We both said enough, and turned off the first film. And it turned out we were like four minutes from the end, and and we were just like we didn't. We managed to miss the guy like in his final throwing up scene apparently, um, and and we just like had it. It was. It was sensational. It was. You don't need to give them this reenacting. I couldn't figure out what he was up to with that. And the other film, which is much quieter, much deeper, it's about um, one of the children, I don't know who, how many of you have seen either of them, but probably more people have seen the first one. Have many of you seen the second? Yeah. No. Yeah. It's really worth seeing. It's, it's, it's about a guy who's an ophthalmologist, and he's the child, or he's the brother of somebody who was killed in those killings, and the child, of course, the parents who went through all of this in that generation, but he's younger, and he goes around, do, he figures out who's done these killings, and he goes to them like, hi, I'm a roving ophthalmologist. Would you like an eye test? 
And as he gives them these eyes, so they got these weird things on their eyes, these little like traveling, you know, like goggles with dials on them and, he's, and their eyes are dilated. And while he's kind of, it's like having somebody in a dentist chair, you're like, aha, now I can tell you my monologue. It, he starts to sort of, well, bring up history. Where were you then? Oh, I know stuff happened around here. What do people say about that now? And he slowly corners some of these guys. And his mother doesn't want anything, like, stop doing that, you're going to get killed. And he goes back to tell her about it. And it's really quieter, it's moving, it gets into these forgiveness issues. He's tough because he's also, he's, inve he's an investigator. It feels like something that's not staged. Maybe what's staged is that there's a camera. You know, that somehow Josh Oppenheim's there with this camera. But he made that movie first. Also, <laughs> apparently he's made that, and then he started to find the, the killers. And of course, the killer, it's like Jean Hatzfeld, who wrote these books about Rwanda. He wrote a book about survivors in French, and then he wrote a book about killers, the killers of that particular group of survivors. And that book got published in English first, because it's the killers. Killers are exciting and, um, and sensational. So I thought that was a, it was a very good movie, but I had real problems with some of it. And I, I think that the second one, is much, much, it, it gets into these things at this deeper level. And he also has the perpetrators talking in this very casual way again about how they did terrible things. But they're like, they talk about how they killed his brother and they remember it. And you really do also feel the weight of all these people having just moved right around each other and known who each other was for many, many years. Um, the difference there, of course, is that you have a society where it worked. It's like, you know, it would be like America after the killing the Indians. That's not a bad thing. That worked. That's part of our proud history of, you know, prevailing against the savages. They killed the communists in Indonesia. And there, any, any interviews, a few officials are like, you know, this could start again if you ask these kinds of questions. It's really powerful stuff. You see the mechanics of it much more deeply and you're less confused by the reenactment problem mm -hmm. which is really interesting as filmmaking but it's I don't know I, 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 I felt like it's one of those things where everybody's highly stimulated and responding intensely to it but nobody's quite sure what just what they've what they really saw like nobody's really been able to explain that movie to me Um, even hearing these uh, stories from you is very disturbing to me. And I wanted to ask you how you managed to contain all these stories and how you managed to live through them. Well, I didn't live through them. I just collected them. I mean, that, but that's important. In other words, you take them in. Well, you know, it's not like I, it's very different than like hearing a story from if you're not working as it were, you know? I mean, in other words, I went, I definitely went deeper this time than I think what I, want, I expected to. And I wasn't trying to like push my limits or something. I was simply like, oh, I have this extraordinary, uh, in a sense, like opportunity or whatever. I didn't think of it as an opportunity in some opportune sense. I mean like, oh, I see that I could actually go and talk to more of the people in this Thing and piece it together and actually construct something with all these people who are kind of invisible to us. And these are people who really have no voice in the world, right? I mean, they're, they're like, in Rwanda, if you go to Kigali, when they read these things, they're like, that was so fascinating what you did, right? We, we don't talk to those people. We don't go to those villages. What happened to him? I'm like, come on, you run a police state. You can't find out what happened to him? I'll say, you know, like to a government official, oh no, we don't like have, we don't really, those records don't really cross our desk. Like, that's the peasantry out there, you know? And, but it's fascinating. I hope you're going to write more about it. It's weird to have these conversations with them. And they know, of course, that there are these stories, and they all have a few of their own. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? In other words, it is interesting. These are, these are problems that occur around the world. This is an extreme and exaggerated version of it at some level, but it's also extreme and exaggerated. The extremity of the genocide is matched by the extremity of this reconciliation, right? I mean, it's, it's actually, the genocide's the easy part to understand. It happens around the world that people commit tremendous atrocities 
and we sort of know the mechanisms of that. To see the rather intense, orchestrated, mass sort of retooling of that social dynamic. However artificial, and part of the mystery is how real or how, how real is this? Is like one of the questions that hovers over all this stuff. Like, it's real, it happened, it's happening, but how real, like how durable, how, and if it falls apart in five years, does that mean it wasn't real now? Lots of things fall apart. You know, our society could fall apart in five years. Does that mean it was all fake for the last 25 or 50 or whatever? We don't know. So uh, that's very interesting. And you sort of stay, and I, I protect myself a lot. I measure the doses in a sense. You know, I go in, I don't go in for longer. I, if I, somebody starts talking and I realize this isn't somebody I am interested in in some way and putting them into this, if they don't fit, thank you. I don't want to hear this and I don't want to make you tell it or ask you to tell it if it's not of interest to me. Um, and every once in a while, you get up in the morning and you like cancel everything because you realize I just, yeah, you need to, you're like a, you're a recording instrument, you know, and, and you can see, I, I'm not a war reporter, you know, I don't actually go into like combat and where everything, but the people who do that, on the one hand, they seem to get off on the adrenaline, but they also, they, they often don't realize until later that they've kind of hurt themselves as, and, and I hurt yourself as a, as, as, like being good and useful to yourself for what you're doing, which is to be able to hear and to see and to kind of remember what's important, not just rushing into the midst of it. So this is very like, this is a slow aftermath. You know, you go and you talk to somebody and you might not go back for half a year to that same spot. And, then, and I also find, and I would say this for anybody who does any kind of reporting, the more often you can go back, the better. If you interview somebody and you can just stop by again, Almost always you'll get new stuff on the second or third time that they'll just, it's like, oh, you're familiar. I'm now used to talking to you. Oh, I forgot to tell you. They're thinking about what they talked about to you too. They may, they, and, and it develops. And even if it's bizarre that the first time they told you a lot and the second time you're suddenly familiar when you're really still a total stranger with a recording device, it, it just, in every society, it's not just sort of, you know, rural people or ministers or what I've found. It works with everybody. They get comfortable with the idea of talking. You make yourself comfortable to talk to. You save certain questions for going back because you don't want to hit them with stuff that disconcerts them maybe right away. You get in deeper where they kind of have to answer for certain things. You develop a frame of reference with them. And... And... You protect yourself. I don't, I mean, that may not really, I'm not, maybe I'm not explaining how I do that, but um, by kind of keeping track of how much you can take and also remembering, like, it's for this, it's for this. Ah, I got my question. Um, I read a book called Cockroaches by Scholastic, and I read it before uh, I read your uh, book about Rwanda. It's a very tiny, such a small book, but so powerful. And um, in both, in your and in her book, um, there was this feeling of warning, of what, in anticipation, what was going to happen. This suffering, there was a pre-genocide or like rehearsal for genocide, but neither you nor her somehow explains why this happened and, you know, how you, it's possible to have then this trans-ethnic identity. So I was wondering, is there any historical research? Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the pre-colonization period, but is there something deeper because of, to explain what happened, it sounds so unexplainable. Well, I mean, it has been somewhat explained, but I'm wary of over-explaining like the perfect mechanism of this thing that really, because then it starts to sound like it's supposed to be inevitable or it, it, it sort of couldn't be any other way. And of course that's never true, right? I mean, it, every part of this didn't have to happen this way, but it did. And so then you look back and you start to see that there are these tremendous patterns. And of course people did have great foreboding. There were massacres that happened from 1959 on when organized violence was used. I mean, broadly speaking, in a country with 85% Hutu majority, 
one of the ways that Hutu politicians organized unity amongst Hutus rather than political conflict amongst Hutus was by the common enemy. And the idea was that if we can say, why are we fighting amongst ourselves when we haven't taken care of these people? That makes us weak to them, was a simple, concrete message. And it took many, many years of like this indoctrination in the schools. Every kid was taught in school the same, you know, these the Tutsis, they did these things to us. There were quotas. And it, there was, it was total impunity. This is the way that the human rights people call it. But what it really means is there was, it was, it was not an offense, right? There was no punishment. There was a reward. It was understood. So many people talk about it in Rwanda now as sort of like in certain regions in particular where the Tutsis were sort of almost bred from birth to understood that someday they may be killed. And the Hutus were sort of bred from birth in some sort of civic and social and familial culture. But many of them say they did not learn it at home at early childhood. As early childhood, these killers and survivors both will say, oh no, we played together just fine. And it was like in second grade, third grade, when they were eight or nine, the teacher would say, all the Hutus stand up, all the Tutsis stand up. And then they'd often be like, what, what are you doing over there? You don't know who you are? Go home and ask your parents. And then they'd go home to their parents and their parents would have to start talking to them about it a little bit. But their parents, in some ways, often wanted to protect them from it, right? So the parent postponed dealing with what they didn't know how to deal with until it came in from the outside. So in the way that parents tried to reassure their children by basically denying this reality, right? Like if they can't do anything about it, like let's not at least breed it into them. And then, then when, I mean, one of the mysterious things is, there's a guy I write about who killed quite a bit, but he, he, he was not like this other killer who was sort of a, a driver behind it. He was a person who they came and knocked on his door when it started and he said, sure. But he knew exactly what was expected of him. And really, by everybody's account, up until that point, he had been like a good mama's boy who went to choir. All he cared about was he went to prayer and he loved his church choir, like five days a week. And like the next day, he went from choir boy to like killing 14 people uh, in one massacre. And the day it was over, it stopped. He stopped. He never, you know, and then he became a big... He was an early sort of, we've got to get this off our chest, this was wrong. But while it was going on, he does not deny that he found it enjoyable, exciting. I mean, the really scary thing is that people found it enjoyable. Yeah, it's obviously enjoyable. This is something we know about people. Most people think that war was pretty exciting if they went to war. It was hell and it was exciting. It was the event. You know, and I mean, I, I, I don't like to go with animal analogies because they're problematic, but I was on a, <laughs> I was out in a game park in, in Tanzania once and you know, you're sleeping out and you hear these lions roaring and they're like, don't worry about it, they're not man eaters. And you say, well, what does that mean? And they say, well, you know, the man eaters, most lions don't eat people. They don't think of people as something to eat. And it's only when one of them eats someone and realizes mm, that was good, you know, basically that they become a man eater. And I'm like, so every man eater has to have their first man. Right, like, and, you know, that's not really reassuring. And, and I do think that, like, what happened in the genocide is that people kind of sorted themselves out. People discovered about themselves. I mean, what you want in society in general is never to be tested. You don't want to find, I mean, at many, many levels, you, you want a society that's kind of set up so you don't find out that most people are awful. Because they are. We know that about societies. They're either, like, horrible bystanders. Most people do not behave well in times of great political turmoil and pressure. Um, we just know that. Now, in many cases, that's like broadly okay and forgivable because like the consequences aren't mass murder. They're kind of just crummy conditions. But you don't want a society where it's testing. Here's a society where they like deliberately put everybody to the test. And the pressure was very high. The rewards were very high. The offense was not joining in. And some people discovered that they liked it or that they were fine with it, or that it excited them for whatever reason. And it's really interesting, like, I mean, it's really interesting, it's really messed up, but people who, for instance, killed, were not always the rapists. Like, there are people who would say, like, oh, he was a big killer, but he never touched anybody, like, to rape them. And then there'll be somebody who was excited by or gotten to the rape, and never was really involved in the killings. Even though the two things were not so 
distant, honestly, and many of the people who were raped were killed. So you actually, and, and, and then there were other people who just kind of ran along with the pack, but you know, they were sort of there, but they weren't really into it. So there's a kind of self-selection. People who had a taste for it discovered that about themselves. And they remain in some way, once you're a killer, you're a killer. Like one of the things I found about talking to these killers is that as they slip back into describing it, and you could see why this was a problem in the Kachacha, is they, they're, they're like not that upset about it. They're upset about what, what happened and how it worked out, but like when they think about it, it makes sense to them in retrospect that in that circumstance, that's, that's how it went down. And not, you can't fully reconstruct that thing without having to make up a theory, but you can see that they all shared this understanding that this was what was going off. And it went off countrywide. And part of what the Gachacha revealed is how much local agency there was. As opposed to that, yes, it came from above, but it also came from the hill. It also came from the local community. And, and like inventiveness and specific knowledge about the victims and torments and terrible things and a sense of carnival. People ate a lot of meat. People who had like protein once or twice a year where suddenly they were just butchering all the cows and eating them. Nobody went to work in the fields, right? It was a world upside down in every sense, and that was exciting. There was, and it was looting. Though, and all the so-called innocent bystander family members were a lot more implicated than anybody really wants to deal with, because they were benefiting. They were eating the they were eating the meat the guy brought home. They were out stealing the pots and pans, and like, I mean, in this conf fashion from this killer that I have on this hill. When you read it, it's like the craziest, it's handwritten, you know, in this ledger. And, I got to and there's one where it's like he's telling this horrible sequence of killings, and then he says, oh, Busu Rimo Stanislas also had a pair of sandals. I, I took those. I apologize for that also. This is like a guy he's killed, right? And you're like, you know, he's talking about flip-flops. You know? So you also are reminded this was very desperate. And one of the ideas that this government had is who would do this? People who had no respect for themselves. You know, you can't win this. It's not a war. It doesn't, it, it, was, it was a very broken system that had created this extremity. But it was a system. And at some point in this book, I'm not really trying to reconstruct an explanation for it so much as an account of how they understand what it means to live with that because they do they have to and so they have to avoid it and they have to deal with it and they have to avoid it and they have to deal with it to get on it's both um, and it goes against all of our grains to think, well, but somebody who killed 35 people shouldn't really be released to live next door to the survivors of those families. That's just like, why can't you at least jail them for life? But if you jail 250,000 men from these village families for life, they're not productive members of society. But if you have a revolution and your main priority is to make the society work again, you've got this other priority. And that's what's going on in Rwanda. And it's really hard to figure out. I mean, this is part of the difficulty of writing something like this is like writing about something that you can get very deep into but you don't necessarily understand. I mean, you can't like finally reach this conclusion like, aha, it works, it doesn't work, it's good, it's not good, I'm for it. I mean, I'm just observing it and describing it. No? I just wonder, uh, what were you for them? How, uh, how did you match their expectations? Were you afraid of uh, intervening in, in their lives? And uh, why, uh, why they wanted to talk with you? I understand why some of them wanted to talk to me. I mean, part of being a reporter that's different from being a writer is you have to be good at being talked to, you know? You have to know how to listen to people and how to like, I mean, I don't really go in there with a big agenda. I'm like, oh, I heard about this, I'm trying to understand that, this is confusing, you know? And I'll listen for a long, long time to whatever they want to say. And then I'll come back again and listen some more. And of course I'm putting it together and I'm guiding it. 
it's really hard in Rwanda to find another Rwandan to talk to who isn't also have a lot at stake. It's very heavy. Like, how do I talk to my friends, even if they're all also survivors, without, like, traumatizing them? So there's sort of, there is some part where I was kind of this shrink confessor, I suppose, though I wasn't playing any of those roles, but I was a person to whom they could talk, like some of them said. I, I mean, I've asked them, why do you talk to me? Well, I always feel better when I talk to you. Like, so it's good to talk. They have, and they, it's weird, because this is another aspect of what we were talking about earlier with translation, but it's weird to write about people who have no real idea what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, in America, people are like, oh, you're going to interview them. You know what your angle should be? Nobody says what your angle should be in Rwanda, you know? Uh, they, they, like, they have no idea what you're doing with this. You know, they don't really, like, the book will never be real to them. I'm not hiding it from them. It's real, like, the first book is read there. It's, a lot of Rwandans have read it. But they don't then think, oh, that killer Gasumari. Let's, like, you know, no Rwandan reporter has ever gone to, like, re-report it or something like that, which would be fine with me. I, have, I don't think I'm, like, gonna, you know, I'm not like, oh, thank God, they've never covered my track. I'm, you know, like, I'll be exposed with my weird fictions. No, I'm just, like, I would think that would be a normal thing to happen at some point. Somebody would say, oh, we have this story. I wonder what became of them. They just don't think like that for whatever reason, the press there. And, and these stories, I mean, it's now, there's the internet, there's cell phones. This, it's much less separated than it was when I first wrote. And even, you know, government offices in Kigali, you couldn't get this stuff until their embassy faxed it to them, more or less. Um, and now, if you write something, even just like a little paragraph. Like it's on Rwandan Twitter and people have read it and they hear about it on the radio. And I mean, I actually once gave an interview on Rwandan radio and some guy calls in and he said, who's that idiot there who doesn't know anything about this country? He should talk to the guy from the New Yorker, Philip Gurevich, who could really set him straight. And I'm like, we all laughed and didn't say, like, that's me, you know? It was just, so, you know, that was very funny because, uh, I'm like, I don't know which one of me he likes better, but, uh, uh, but it was, and I can't quite remember what I just said that made him so uh, indignant about my ignorance, but, um, but I set myself straight. And, uh, you know, so there are these people who have some kind of connection to this. That wouldn't have happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, certainly. There's not, it's not censored. They're not worried about it. The other thing that's interesting is they're not worried about it. And to the extent that they're worried about it, they're worried about it super locally. Nobody's thinking about what they're going to think in Kigali. They're thinking about what they're going to think, like the mayor or the like sub-district bureau chief, you know? I mean, sector chief. And they're... Because they live really locally, just like the Gachacha courts were really local. But they're not mostly afraid of talking about this stuff, which is partly also, I think, a measure of the success, a success of Gachacha you know, which is that this stuff is now, before the trials, it was always in front of them, this thing that hadn't been dealt with fully. Now, if you're in prison, it's because you didn't confess or because you were found guilty or because you committed like such a, like a crime of torture or rape at a certain level that you're like a life sentence. Many of them are back in their communities, but also there's no more killing of survivors because there's no need to kill survivors if they're not going to bear witness against you. And there's a sort of acceptance that this is the order of things now. And there's no more revenge killing. Because they've been dealt with. You don't have to leave it to them. Like, you don't have to feel I have to take this into my own hands. And so some of this stuff is being worked through. Um, so what's my role? I don't know what all of them think. Something like a better kachacha for them. You, you've been... Something like this, maybe. Like, huh? uh, you, uh, I, am I right to say that uh, you became for them something like a, a better kachacha reconciliation tool? Yeah, I mean, they like talking. Of, I mean, they, they found it not threatening and somehow okay to try and explain their situation. And they, they took the fact that I kept coming back as like, you seem to be very interested and nobody seems to have a problem with you. And it was sort of like this weird accumulation with people, you know, sort of like, well, if everybody's okay with you, then we're all okay with you. You know, it wasn't as if I'd done anything. 
And, and also, I didn't publish for a long time, which helps, right? So you just keep it, no, nobody's really reacting to what you're doing. Um, and so they're just wondering what you're doing. But they, you're not doing anything wrong. And yeah, I think it was, I think for some of them it was comfortable. Sometimes people would just say like, look, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And I never acted like you should or you must or, or so. I would say, well, sometimes I try a little bit, you know, to see if that was penetrable. But mostly, why would I do that? Um, and unless I thought they were, I mean, if I thought they were completely hiding something, I might noodle at it a little. But no, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not like some cop. Um, and I was always a little bit wondering, like, what do you do when you hear something and, like if I, and there are cases where I know people committed crimes that they didn't fully confess. Well, I'll write about that. Nobody's gonna do anything about it, but if they do, that's not my problem. They committed those crimes. If people get accused of crimes they didn't commit because of something I wrote, that would bother me. Um, but I don't see that happening. And I do sometimes change or protect names. Mostly though, it's again, it's for privacy in their immediate world. It's not because they're, con I mean like, Victor is not Victor's name. But I can't figure out why it was that he just was like, I don't want to be written about. But I understand that. And he probably intersects with a world where people would recognize him if it was really his name. So what would, makes no difference to me. He's 100% real except for the name. I'll signal that in the book. But I think I'm overrunning your clock also, so I don't want to do that. Thank you.